Amen. So last week, kind of uh, without warning, um, you know, Saturday night, God changed my message for uh, that day. I have a hard time teaching anything in one service because uh, I always just think of so much that I want to say about uh, whatever it is that I'm sharing on. I have a series that I'm starting next week on, your, on the soul that you do not want to miss. I've never taught uh, what I'm going to be teaching next week. And so, uh, and I think it's going to be so informative and also so very, very helpful in your lives, very pr- uh, practical as far as the application is concerned, which we always endeavor to do that. But last week, I had God deal with me about talking to you about the power of little things, which what's interesting is, is God had me talk to, uh, whenever I was in Bolivar, thinking I was going to teach on vision, he dealt with me about that Sunday morning about going a different direction. And, and it's actually, I taught on the power of little things there. What's funny is, Dave and Emily will tell you what I taught on the power of little things there was nothing like what I taught on the power of little things here last week. And I just, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed last Sunday. How about, how about you? Just, just referring to uh, places in the Bible where it refers to just little things that God used to bring about great change and to produce, you know, great results in the lives of his people. I'm glad God asked for little things from us because little is really about all we have to offer. But when we offer God our little, how many know when he gets done breathing on that and blessing that uh, there's a lot of great things that come out of it. Isn't that right? And so I'm talking again about the power of little things. Everybody say little things. So the Bible, as I said last week, talks a lot about the power of little things. I gave you a verse from the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, catch for us the foxes, and then it qualifies it, and it says the little foxes. There's a lot of foxes running around, uh, you know, in Vermillion County right now. I think I've seen more foxes and coyotes than I've seen in a long time. And uh, how small foxes are, I guess, always amazes me. I always expect them to be bigger than what they are. But he says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes. Why? Because they ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. So really what he is telling us there is this, is that it isn't the big things that are messing up our lives, that, are, that is ruining our lives. It's the little things. It's the little things that we aren't addressing and that we aren't dealing with. Jesus talked a lot about the power of little things. One of those places, Luke chapter uh, 16, verse 10, he says, if you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you'll be dishonest with greater responsibilities. And so the key really is what he is saying there. The key to being entrusted with greater things is to first be faithful in the little things that he's already entrusted you with. And you can just carry that over into every aspect of your life. The key to having more money is to manage the little bit of money that you may have right now. The key to having a great marriage is to faithfully do the little things that it takes to build a great marriage because it doesn't take big things to build a great marriage. It takes a lot of little things, doing them consistently, doing them faithfully to build a great marriage. So never underestimate the power of little things. We talked about it. David took a little stone and he brought down a big giant. Isn't that right? Jesus took a little boy's little lunch, for that matter, five loaves and two fishes. You can matter, just a little bit of bread, a couple of fish, and he fed 5,000. That sure is little in comparison to the number of of people who are fed. And Jesus said that with just a little faith, and we're actually going to talk about that here in just a moment, you can actually move the mountains in your life. So little things matter. Think about it in very, very practical terms. I was around for this. Some of you won't, won't be, won't have been, but many of you were. 1986, seven people boarded the Space Shuttle Challenger, and in 73 seconds on live TV, the Challenger went up in the sky and exploded in front of everyone who was watching. You remember that. All seven of the astronauts, first teacher that had ever been on board, uh, all died in that uh, terrible explosion. 
And when they investigated what went wrong, they discovered it was a little thing. Do you remember what it was? It was an O-ring that wasn't tight enough that caused the explosion. So a little O-ring caused that terrible explosion. So, it, it, you know, little things matter a great deal. Usually in big things that undermine our marriages, it's the little things. No wife ever said, I'm divorcing him. I've never had a wife say this to me when she came in, when a couple came in for counseling. I'm divorcing him because he won't buy me a mink coat. I'm divorcing him because he won't buy me a BMW like the neighbor has. No, you know what they'll say? I'm divorcing him because he won't spend any, t any time with me. Uh, he doesn't show any affection towards me. He just doesn't seem to care about me. It is always the little things, but boy, let me assure you, while it sounds like a little thing, how many know it is a big thing to your wife? It is a big thing to your husband if it's on uh, the other uh, foot, so... How many of you have ever found just a little hair in your food? You're just getting ready to sit down and eat. Oh, man, yum, yum. Come on. And then you reach down there and you take your fork to take that first bite and there is a little hair. Come on. How many of you, once you see that little hair, come on, you say it, you're sending it back, right? But even that's kind of turned your stomach just a little bit, right? You know, I, I'm like that. I, you know, and if it's my hair, I think hey, I'll push it aside. You know, if it's Cash's hair, what the heck? Cash, I probably eat his hair anyway, not even knowing I'll push it aside. You know, what, whatever. But if I'm in the restaurant and I'm not sure whose it is, come on. You're getting my food back. Bring me some more food. Uh, we went to uh, dinner at a really nice restaurant in Indy one time, downtown Indy, with a couple and uh, they took us there. I can't remember the name of it, but just upscale steak house. And I remember the steak was great. And the couple who took us, uh, she ordered a salad of some kind. And when they brought that salad, it looked, man, delicious. I'm almost wishing that I just ordered that salad instead of the steak that I ordered. And she's about three bites in, and she looks down at her salad, and there's not a hair. There is a worm crawling around on the lettuce. Come on. Well, it's just a little worm. <laughs> so I guess little, little things do matter. Is that what? Yeah, I, I, I thought so. Yeah. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I'm already grossing you out. How many of you are glad you're the early service and you got a little time to recover before we go to lunch, right? Ecclesiastes 10.1. As dead flies cause even uh, a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little foolishness. Everybody say a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. Can I tell you, you can have such wisdom and have such honor that you generally show and you generally walk in, and then you, in a moment, can do something that is so very, very foolish, and how many know you can mess up, you can undo whatever it is that you've been investing a lot of time and a lot of wisdom and a, and a, lot, of, a lot of enter into. So it's the little things, it's the little thoughts, it's the little words, it's the little actions, it's the little glance, it's the little lapses in judgment, uh, it's a little bit of compromise that often lead to some pretty big consequences. And so what you're going to discover, the longer you live this life, and I've lived a bit of it, is that life, you know, occasionally it's filled with big things, but generally it's just simply filled with a lot of little things, and success comes from mastering and also leveraging those little things, making sure they're working on your behalf, not against you. And if you don't pay attention to the little things, how many know you're going to end up with some pretty bad messes and some pretty bad situations in your life? Amen? So little things can seem inconsequential. They can seem insignificant. We can tend to overlook them. We can tend to underestimate the power of little things. But little things can be powerful Little things can make a big difference in our life. And so the question I'm asking you this morning as we jump into this is, how are you managing, how are you leveraging the little things in your life? What kind of little things are you talking about? Well, I thought about several. Don't know how many I'll have the opportunity to talk to you about. I'd like to talk to you about a few that are, I think, positives, but then I want to also talk to you about a few negatives that I think you need to definitely learn how to master in your life. But the first thing I think you need to learn how to master is your attitude. Everybody say, my attitude. 
Your attitude, whether you realize it or not, is a big deal. And it's a little thing that makes a huge difference in your life. Your attitude, whether you realize it or not, is actually a focus of God's work in your life. It's a major focus of God's work in your life. In fact, the very first sermon Jesus ever taught, Matthew chapter 5, had to do with attitudes. In fact, remember what the title of the, this sermon is called. What, we, what we've called the sermon anyway, we call it the Beatitudes. Everybody say, the Beatitudes. And in it, he tells us these attitudes that we're to embrace. And if we embrace them, we will live blessed lives. And he gives us a number of them, one of them. I just gave you one here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. And he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I've taught you before what the word blessed means. And just as a reminder though, the word blessed means a couple of other things. But it means this for sure. And it definitely means this when it comes to we're talking about our attitude, but it means to empower, to prosper. So Jesus is saying, when you embrace this attitude in your life, it's going to empower you to prosper. And again, he gives us a number of those attitudes that we need to embrace. And when we do, they'll empower us to prosper regardless of our environment, regardless of the circumstances we face. I used to get really down when bad things would happen to me. And I'd just be discouraged for a while and just be so negative. And I'd talk so negative about it and just, you know, I don't know why. And I just, I don't, I don't, I'm going to quit. And I found out that none of that worked for me. Come on, are y'all hearing me? Listen, here's why your attitude is so important. is because it controls your perspective. It controls your thoughts. And it controls your actions, your behavior. Are you all hearing me? So if I go negative, if I go south... In my attitude, it's going to change my perspective. I'm going to have a dim view of what's going on. I'm going to start thinking negative thoughts, and I'm not going to do the things that I need to do to succeed. Take two people, put them in exactly the same circumstances. The person who has a bad attitude will always fail. And how many know the person who has a great attitude will always figure out a way to rise above it? Isn't that right? So your attitude is a, is a little thing that makes a big difference in your life. In fact, your attitude is often the only difference between success and failure in your life. Last week, talked about it for just a moment. And in this context, uh, Numbers chapter 13, the Israelites as a group arrive at the promised land. Moses sends 12 spies into that land, have them check out the land, see what it's all about, see what's going on there, see what they might face when they get there. And they come back, those 12 spies, and the Bible says 10 of them had an evil report. It doesn't just call it a bad report. It says 10 of them had an evil report. Can I tell you, if the Bible says it was an evil report, it's a report that God did not want them to have. It's a, it's a take on things that God did not want them to have. They're about to say things to people that God doesn't want them saying to people. Are you hearing me? And they said, we went into the land, and it looks exactly like God says. It is a land that flows with milk and honey, but. Come on, everybody say but. They said, there are giants in the land, and compared to them, we are grasshoppers, and we are not able to go in and possess the land. And you know what? Because of their negative report, because of their bad attitude, you know, they didn't go in and possess the land. In fact, that whole generation died off. And then their kids went in and possessed that promised land. But there were two guys who tried to change everybody's opinion that day, but they were out, you know, they were, uh, you know, out to, uh, what am I looking for the word here? They're, you know, uh, over, over uh, ruled by all of the evil reports. Come on. Uh, you know, sometimes we think the majority is right. How I many know oh, that was an occasion when they would have been better off to listen to the minority? Isn't that right? Joshua and Caleb says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen to me. We are well able. Everybody say, we are well able to go in and possess the land. And you know what? 40 years later, those all died off except for Joshua and Caleb and their family. And they went walking into the promised land with that next generation to possess the land. Amen. How many know the ones who said we are not able? And the ones who said, we are able, they were both right. Amen? When you say, I can't, you're right, you can't. 
When you say, I can, you know what? You're right. You can. But I'll tell you this. When you say, I can't, it's because you're relying on your own ability and your own strength and your own wisdom and your own power. How many know when you say you can, it's because you know if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen? So your attitude makes a difference. Yeah. So oh, that's all great, you know, but, uh, you know, what's that have to do with my marriage? It has everything in the world to do with your marriage. In fact, if you want to just write this down before I say, talk about that, you ought to write down your attitude predicts your future. It really does. Your attitude predicts your future. If you think about uh, the spies, their attitude, it, it predicted each one or their future. You, you have a great attitude. You'll just keep moving up and up and up in every aspect of your life. You got a bad attitude. Uh, yeah, it, life's just not going to be good to you at all. But just think about how a negative, doubting, faithless, ungrateful, complaining, these are all attitudes that we can have in our lives. Those always limit God. Psalm 78, 41, talking about the Israelites again, but it's David referencing them. He says, yes, again and again, they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. Come on, isn't it, isn't it amazing to think that you can limit God? Amen? You can limit God. And the way they limited God was how? By their bad attitude. And you limit God whenever you've got a negative attitude, a complaining attitude, whatever, you limit God from moving in your life. You know, uh, just think about how your attitude towards your spouse, uh, towards your marriage has impacted your marriage. You know, just you can take that in any direction in your life. But, you know, I know that whenever my wife and I were struggling, we just didn't have a great attitude towards each other. And so since we didn't have a great attitude towards each other, it changed our perspective. It skewed our perspective towards each other. She just this. He's just that. You just, you know, she's impossible to get along with. She's so bullheaded. And she just, you know, I'm sure she thought things about me. And you're all sure too, right? But, uh, yeah, come on. But it, it, it changed our thoughts towards each other, our, the way we treated each other. But you know what? When we changed our attitudes towards each other, it changed the way we viewed each other. It changed the way we talked to each other. Oh, yeah, come on. The way we behave towards each other. And our marriage been to, began to miraculously turn around. Amen. Everybody say, my attitude may be small, but it makes a big difference. Attitudes are like flat tires. You're not going to get anywhere until you change your attitude. Amen. Yeah, you're not going to get anywhere until you change your attitude. And here's what you need to realize before we move on is nobody uh, chooses your attitude for you. Life doesn't determine the attitude that you have in life. You choose your attitude. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Paul would have never said to have the same attitude uh, that Jesus had if it wasn't possible for you to have the same attitude that Jesus had. I've given this example before, but uh, every once in a while when I was growing up, I could cop a bad attitude. My dad was 6'2", 6'3", something like that, big guy. My stepdad, he's a lot bigger than me, had fingers. One, two of my fingers make one of his fingers. And you think I'm joking, I'm not. He's just a big guy. And uh, so, you know, when he said something to you, you it was like E.F. Hutton, you listened. Or, you know, you got thumped really good. But anyway, I can remember copping a bad attitude. My dad would say, boy, you better change that attitude and you better change it right now. Come on. How many know... To ask me to change my attitude if it's not possible to change my attitude is, you know, that's wrong, right? But you know what? I found out when dad said change your attitude, I, I can change my attitude. Yeah, I can be, and then dad said change your attitude. Yeah, I can do that, right? Come on. You choose your attitude. Everybody say, I choose my attitude. So Listen, I'm just going to just obey the Lord. I've kind of started off the day doing that. I guess I, I'll do that more often. But anyway, I'm just kidding. I try to do it every day. Some of you have a rotten attitude towards your spouse. And I don't care how big God is. I don't care how big you claim to be God to be in your life. Your marriage ain't turning around until you change your attitude towards your spouse. If you're going to have that nasty attitude, you better enjoy what you got. 
Because it ain't getting any better until you change your attitude. Amen? So I says, well, when she changes her, I'll change mine. Good luck with that. Come on. How many know? Listen, we're not supposed to obey the word based on what anybody else does. Spouse or anyone. When I read something in the Bible and I find out it's true, I'm supposed to embrace that and do that whether you do it or not. Amen? And that might be hardest at home because I'm around my wife the most and she's around me the most. But you know what? While it may be harder and I may be hit with it more often, that actually is what will help build into me the habit of maintaining a right attitude in my life. Amen? Yeah. This is good preaching. Pretty bad when I got to say it's good preaching and you don't. But if you're not going to say amen, I will. So anyway, so everybody say my attitude. So an attitude. All right. Here's the second thing that is a little thing, but it carries great power, is a word. Your words. Your words are powerful. Many of you already know these things. They're just review. But you know what? Sometimes we need a little review um, because... We may be knowing it, but how many know we ain't always doing it? And that's why the Bible, and I think it's in First Peter, he says, I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things, lest you let them slip. How many know he probably said that because they were letting them slip? And uh, so this might be something you've been letting slip. Your words, the way you talk, the things you say have so much power. Death and life, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life. That's, that's pretty big. Death and life. <laughs> are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so every time you and I speak, we're either releasing life or death into our lives, into our circumstances, and into our relationships. Yes, by the words of our mouth. We spent years speaking, saying terrible things to each other. What are we doing? We're speaking death into our relationship. So amazingly, the relationship never got better until we changed those words. And uh, it's so hard to change those words at first because you just didn't feel them. But, you know, uh, that's, I guess the Bible does say that. You know, I, I guess I should have waited till we feel because the Bible says we walk by feelings, not by faith. Right? Oh, no, no. It says we walk by what? Faith, not by... Oh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. I thought I was supposed to go by the way I feel. Well, you watch the body of Christ, it would sure seem that way. So, yeah, so you know what? That means I, I'm supposed to faith it sometimes when I don't feel it. And in fact, faith it doesn't mean I'm faking it. Faithing it means I'm choosing to believe that what God says is true and that when I put what he says to work in my life, it will work, come on. And so I'm going to faith it in this moment. And even though I'm not feeling it, I'm going to say something kind. I'm going to say something generous. I'm going to say something good. Hmm. Have you ever noticed how when you do that, it just changes how you feel in the moment? Well, I'm not done being mad yet. Okay. Well, sit there and stew for a while, I guess. You must enjoy being mad more than I did. I hate it. I don't like being mad. I don't like wasting a moment in any relationship by being upset by someone. What's, where's the, come on. Someone says, well, they just need to pay. Really? Hmm. Give, and it shall be given unto you again. So you want to make them pay? What's that verse you just said got to do with that? I thought that was when I give, God's going to give back to me. Yeah, it, is. it works that way, but it works in reverse too. When I give, hateful, guess what I get back? Good measure, press down. Come on. When I give, being unkind, guess what? She gives me back. Yeah. How come when I talk about her, you all just get real quiet? Like, <laughs> it's like I'm talking about one of the Godhead or something. Can I tell you, when, we, when you get to heaven, my wife is not going to be sitting there. She, I know she seems so sweet, and she is most of the time, but she, she is. So everybody say, you got to faith it. Death and life are in the power. So your words have the power to build up or tear down. And, it, 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, listen to what the Apostle Paul, in light of the fact that our words have the power of death and life in them, he understands that. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful <laughs> for building others up according to their needs. How many of you know, if we put that into practice, we're probably going to be talking less, Right? Because we're not going to be able to say in the moment sometimes what we would like to say. But you know what? That's, that's good. That's okay. If I'm not going to say, if I'm not going to let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth, if that's the grid that my speech has to run through, and what I'm about to say is not unwholesome, then I, then I can't say it. Well, I just saved myself some problems, didn't I? I just saved myself. I just, just choosing not to speak those little words. Come on, are y'all hearing me? Yeah. And something awesome, something good is on the end of it. But only what is good for building others up according to their needs. Not according to my needs, but according to their needs. So I'm always thinking about the other person when I speak. I'm not thinking about me. Let me ask you something. How often when you're talking to your spouse, are you thinking about you and your needs in what you're about to say? Especially whenever you're about, to, you're about to say unwholesome things. Especially whenever you're about to say, you know, things that are not lovely. Come on, are you all hearing me? I'd say there's probably more than likely a really good chance that what you're about to say is all predicated on you and your feelings in the moment. Amen? You're not about to say something that uh, builds others up according to their needs. What does she need to hear in this moment? Well, she does not need to hear me say something hateful back. Come on. She may have just said something that wasn't all that kind to me, but she does not need to hear me. If she's saying something hateful to me, obviously something's bothering her. Probably me, but something's bothering her, right? Is this okay? I know this is ABCs. I realize that. <laughs> but you're not failing in life because you're not smart enough or because you're not gifted enough because you don't know enough it's the ABCs we miss out on it's the little things the attitude the words little things that just make absolutely huge differences in our mouth Proverbs chapter 10 verse 21 I love this verse the lips of the righteous feed many. And I heard a guy ask this question one time, and it convicted me so much. And I don't remember how he worded it, so I've got it worded the best I can remember. He said, but if your words were a meal, would the people in your world enjoy a feast or would they experience a famine? Can the people in your world live, live off the words you speak? The lips of the righteous feed many. I like that. How about you? People can live off of what you say. People, your words are life-giving. Your words build them up. Your words encourage them. Your words make them feel like I can. Come on. When they sit down, yeah, it's like a feast. The lips of the righteous, they feed many. And we'll say this, and then I'll move on about words. But your words can either create mountains or your words can move mountains. In Mark eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said this about our words. He said, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So he said, with my words, with my faith-filled words, and I'm facing a mountain in my life. Come on. Those faith-filled words, because they're connected with God, and because God moves whenever we speak faith-filled words, it'll move the mountains that are in my life. Mountain, you're, you're, you're moving in Jesus' name. Come on. You may come out a shovel at a time, but you're coming down one way or another. Amen? But can I tell you, you just take that, and flip it to where it's negative, 
And how many know the same what mouth that you could use to speak words that would move your mountains? You could start saying words that are going to make your mountain bigger and bigger and bigger. It's so big. It's so bad. There's no way. You know, come on. And interestingly, the same way I choose my attitude, I also choose my words. The Bible says, let the words of your mouth, Psalms 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This will help you. This is not supposed to be a marriage series. But for some reason, that's, I just feel like it might be helping there. If Jesus was standing beside you, would you say the same words? Would you say what you're about to say? Would you speak to your wife or to your children the way you've always spoken to them or the way that you're about to speak to them? Kenneth Copeland, I used to listen to Kenneth all, all the time, and I thank God for Kenneth Copeland taught me the word in a way that my denomination never did. And taught me faith. It taught me the authority of the believer. And uh, he was talking about him and his relationship with Gloria, and apparently they were having a little bit of an argument that day. He wasn't treating her the best. And he said he heard the Lord speak to him. He said, Kenneth, that's my daughter, and I appreciate it if you'd talk to her like she's my daughter. Well, that's, you know. Gloria, that's between Ken and Gloria. The only thing is, I happen to know that my wife happens to be his daughter also. So I figure if he wants Kenneth talking to Gloria, yeah. 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 amen. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? We think we can just talk hateful to each other and it's just going to turn our, our relationships around and just do that all of our lives. And then complain about the marriage that we have. Amen? We choose our words. Everybody say we choose our words. How about a thought? A thought's a little thing. You ever told anybody, well, it's just a thought. And sometimes maybe it's not a great thought. Maybe not one you want to embrace. But I thought about how just a wrong thought in a moment. And how it can change your life. And I thought clear back to the book of Genesis. And Eve's in the garden, enjoying the beauty of the Garden of Eden. And Satan shows up. He's in the form of a serpent. And he starts messing with her thinking. Huh, didn't God say you could eat of any tree you wanted to eat of? She said, yeah, except for this one. And he said, we're not supposed to eat of it. And we're not even supposed to touch it. Which he didn't say you couldn't touch it. But she's, she knows that. She's that aware. It's that big of a deal to her that she knows she's not supposed to be fooling with it. Uh, because the day that you do, you'll die. And, she, and the enemy says, you'll not die. You'll not die. Here's why God doesn't want you eating from that. He knows that in the day that you do, you're going to become like he is, and you're going to know the difference between good and evil. So in that moment, Satan was able to sell Eve the lie that God was holding out on her. That she's missing out. And that if she'd just do this, she'd just take that bite, even though God told her not to, she'd experience something that she's never going to experience otherwise, and it's good. Can I tell you, I, I thought about that. Isn't that kind of how the enemy tempts all of us and how he gets, come on, just in a moment, gets us messing with our thinking and convinces us that we're missing out on something, and if we'll just do this, it's going to make our, if we'll just, man, if she was just in my life, my, I would have, I'd be so much happier. Well, the only problem with she is you're married and she's married. Yeah, I know, but we both love each other. I hmm. wonder who thought you've been listening to. Well, just can't fight these feelings anymore. Isn't that, I can't fight these feelings anymore. Right? Scared some of you. But I scared you awake. Yeah. 
Now, I don't care what kind of feelings you got. You're about to listen to a wrong thought. Amen? And in a moment, a simple little thought that you normally would have just not given any place to, you normally just would have just went right through. But in this moment, because of where you're at and because things are not good, now you're latching on to this thought. And how many know the moment you latch on, latch on to that thought, you are about to head down a road that is going to cause you and a whole lot of other people around you nothing but trouble moving forward. Amen? Sure is quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> David looks over. He's supposed to be fighting battle. He's got his guys all sent out. They're all fighting. He's not. And uh, he looks over the edge of his palace. When he does, he sees a beautiful woman who is bathing. And instead of, first of all, being, not being where he ought to be, um, well, there's probably a message there. There's a thought. Hmm. And would you agree with me that thought in that moment led to one thing after another that he's about to do that's going to cause him nothing but heartache. Isn't that right? Wonder what thoughts you've given place to in a moment. Move it away from that kind of a temptation. What, if, what about this thought? God doesn't ever do anything for me. The church has never done anything for me like that. And you give place in a moment to a wrong thought. We've had people leave the church over dumb things. Are you hearing me? Just embrace a wrong thought in a moment that sets them on a path that I think was different than the path that God would have had them on. Everybody say a little attitude. A few words. Just a wrong thought. Amen. Amen. And Adiba, Adiba, that's all I have time for, folks. <laughs> Is that okay? So much we could talk about. And I don't think I'm going to continue this next week. But uh, we'll come back and talk about some more little things later on. I will tell you the, the negative things. Just in, when I say I'll tell you, I'm giving them to you real quick. But. In the book of 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, the Apostle Paul comes to the church and he finds out that there is a guy who's sleeping with his stepmother. And uh, Corinthian church was all about grace, I guess. But how many know it was grace? Uh, unqualified for sure. And I think they were boasting about how grace gracious and accepting they were. He says, man, your boasting is not good at all. This is, this should not be being tolerated. And here's what he says. He says, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And leaven is like the yeast that women put in, whoever cooks bread. Shouldn't even said women. Guys cook bread too, I guess, huh? I never had. But anyway, <laughs> think about it, nor has my wife. But anyway, <laughs> yeast. You know, uh, uh, how many cooks we got in here? Terry, how much, how much yeast do you put in bread? Is it a lot? Is it a little? Just a little. Compared to all the other ingredients, a little yeast causes the whole thing to rise. A little leaven leaven levels leavens the whole lump. In other words, you tolerate that, you're just opening the door to just tolerating so much more in your life. Amen. Everybody say a little sin. Everybody say a little false doctrine. In Galatians Galatians chapter 5, the Galatian church, he says, man, you're, you were running so well. 
But now you've started embracing this thing that you feel like you need to be circumcised again. You know, like you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so they're going back to works. And basically this is a false doctrine. And he says the same thing. He said a little bit of leaven, a little bit of leaven. This, he says this false teaching is like a little yeast. I'm reading it out of a, a, the New Living Translation. A little, this false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. Can I tell you, there's a whole bunch of stuff being said right now in the church world that you need to take and you need to rightly divide it and you need to bring it and line it up with God's word because I tell you, a little bit of false doctrine will get you way off. When you swallow a little, how many know you end up swallowing a lot? Amen. Amen. A little sin, a little false doctrine, and then as Solomon said, little foxes. Little foxes, little things that you don't address and you don't deal with in your life. He says, they'll spoil everything. So, little things. One more time, everybody say the power of little things. Life is filled with little things. How I master and how I leverage little things will determine how successful I am in my walk with God. It isn't the big things that are causing me problems. It's these little things that happen every day of my life. Yeah. Bow, bow your heads with me if you would.